Friends, welcome to another video lecture for Greek exegesis of Revelation. The title of this lecture is Persecution in Early Christianity and in Asia Minor. Really, the purpose of this lecture is to provide a bit more context and color to the language of persecution and of, of suffering that we see in the book of Revelation. Uh, for many New Testament scholars, uh, the book of Revelation, 1 Peter, Hebrews, and Mark are those New Testament writings that give us the clearest indication of some sort of persecution or social ostracism as a result of one's affiliation with the early Christian movement or perhaps with the non-participation in the larger religious world of antiquity. For this lecture, I really want to focus in on three questions. What? What is the evidence of persecution in the New Testament? Why? Why were Christians persecuted by their non-Christian neighbors and uh, by provincial authorities? And finally, where? Focusing in on Christianity in Asia Minor. So to begin, what is the evidence of persecution? I will more or less be moving chronologically through the New Testament, and I've provided on the slides fuller references that I'll talk about more in a summary fashion. And so the place to begin is, is with the evidence from Paul's letters in Acts that Paul himself, as a zealous Pharisee, was persecuting, was actively persecuting members of the uh, the Christian movement of the ecclesia of God, he says. And so we see this in Acts 9, we see this in Galatians, uh, and in other places in the letters attributed to Paul. And what's interesting and important about this is it seems to be authorized through the synagogue, through the chief priests, through a religious sort of entity, rather than through a larger government or uh, provincial authority. 1 Thessalonians, one of our very earliest writings in the New Testament, gives witness to the experience of persecution for those living in Thessalonica uh, in chapter 2. We, we learn that they are experiencing persecution in the same sort of way that Jewish believers in Christ experienced in Judea. And so the interesting thing here is it seems to be co-religionists or compatriots, um, sort of uh, cultural or religious proximity that is is creating the form of persecution. We also know of Paul's own imprisonment uh, as a result of his work in the early Christian movement. We see this in his prison epistles as well as throughout the book of Acts as he travels and appeals to Caesar near the end of of Acts. In 1 Peter, a writing that is most likely written to Christians living in Asia Minor, just like Revelation, we, we see this idea that these former Gentiles, these former pagans, we might call them, are now being maligned as evildoers by their, their former compatriots, um, that those Gentiles are surprised that they no longer join them in, uh, in a particular way of life, and as a result, they blaspheme them. The author makes the distinction between suffering as a Christian, suffering because of one's Christian convictions or because of one's unwillingness to associate or uh, um, uh, participate in the larger religious and cultural world of their surroundings. What's interesting about 1 Peter, though, is that there is, even in the midst of this language about persecution, a very clear exhortation to uh, honor, accept, all secular authorities, especially the emperor, it says in chapter 2. And so again, we, we have this idea of, of Gentiles who have now aligned themselves with the, the Christ community, are being blasphemed, are being uh, surprised, are being uh, maligned as evildoers. Sort of verbal attacks and social ostracism appear to be uh, the case here in First Peter. In Hebrews, a, a book that I have spent a good amount of time studying and, and love, uh, in chapter 10, we get some really clear images of uh, the sorts of persecution that Christians might have faced. Uh, there's reference to public exposure of abuse and persecution. That seems to be both physical and verbal abuse. Um, 
There is a reference to showing compassion to those who are in prison. And so uh, the possibility that, that there was imprisonment for early Christians. And then in 1034, this referencing to the plundering of possessions, the loss of possessions or the loss of economic uh, livelihood as a result of being a Christ follower. Now, the, the references in Hebrews are, are not as clear whether or not these are uh, Jews who are doing this to Christ believing Jews or to Gentiles or whether it's uh, Gentiles doing this. Uh, but again, what, what seems to be happening in Hebrews, as we saw uh, in in First Thessalonians, is it's very regional. It may not be official in the sense of uh, provincial authorities, but it but it is pronounced and it is uh, both economic and uh, in terms of uh, physical abuse and, and verbal abuse uh, leading to social ostracism. In the Gospels, which are some of our later writings in the New Testament, although they, they preserve earlier traditions, we see, for example, in Mark 13, 9, this idea of uh, being handed over to councils, being bit, beaten in synagogues, and standing before governors and kings. This seems to be a clear indication from the Gospel of Mark that that the sort of the form of uh, persecution or of trial may take a variety of forms. So it could be uh, within religious councils or, or city or uh, sort of provincial councils. It could be in synagogues. Synagogues had a important sort of judicial function in the ancient world, or it could be before governors and kings. In John 9.22, this story of the blind man who is healed, we get this other reference, an important reference to being put out of the synagogue because of one's uh, uh, decisions or association with the Christ, uh, the Christ movement, with, with early Christianity. So if we, if we think about all of these references, and, and I probably could have selected more, we can come to a certain number of conclusions. First, we can conclude that that the persecution of Christians was early, but it was sporadic. It was not systematic. It was not uniform. And it wasn't official, at least in the earliest period. It was mostly local and regional in its nature. It was mostly fellow pagans or co-religionists or compatriots who were uh, bringing charges or, or making some sort of judgment or punishment on Christians. And as we've seen, there's a variety of forms that persecution took. It could be verbal attack or social ostracism. It could be physical abuse. It could be the loss of property or possessions. It could be imprisonment or formal trials. So there isn't a uniform experience of persecution or of, of what was, was entailed in that. But, it, but we do, I think, have good grounds to say that it was early. It was mostly local. It was uh, sporadic and that it took a variety of forms. Next, I want to consider the why question. Why would Christians experience persecution? And I think the fundamental sort of baseline idea here is that in the ancient world, the mixing of religion and politics, the mixing of religion and everyday life was, was much more you know, cl closely aligned maybe than it is in our modern context. And also the baseline idea of polytheism. The way polytheism works is, you know, it's in everybody's best interest to worship all of the gods. Because if you don't, you might piss one of them off. And that god might affect the agriculture or sea travel or the peace of the city. And so part of polytheism is the belief that we worship so that we don't fall out of favor with one god or another. So if we think about this, then um, worship in a cultic act or worship or, or cultic activity, cultic rituals signaled a number of things. It, it signaled religious devotion. It signals communal piety, sort of a sense of belonging and of doing these things together. But it also ultimately communicated loyalty to the Roman state. Again, royalty or, or loyalty rather to the city because of the idea that if we are honoring these gods, they are going to protect us. They are going to benefit us. And if we don't do that, then we run the risk of, of danger or of travesty or of blight or of uh, um, famine and so forth. And what's interesting sort of as a as a maybe an aside to this baseline idea is that 
there were exemptions or exceptions made for ancient Judaism. It, it, although there are really terrible things that have been said about ancient Jews by, by ancient authors, generally the Roman Empire regarded them as acceptable. Part of that was that there was a tax, a Jerusalem temple tax that went towards honoring the emperor. Um, but in general, they were okay with Jews not participating in the wider, larger world of uh, the, the Greco-Roman and Roman religions. And that's important because as Christians experienced separation from Judaism, as those two um, forms of being religious began to separate, and that's a separation that didn't end until you know the middle of the second century. But as it began to separate, Christians no longer had that exception or that exemption, and they experienced persecution as a result. I think that there's good reason to think that the major cause of persecution was non-participation. If you didn't participate in the in the emperor worship, that could be perceived as politically disloyal. And if you didn't sacrifice to local gods or participate in their festivals, that was perceived as ultimately putting the city and the inhabitants at risk. It was really dangerous and problematic. So both at a religious level, a political level, and at a sort of cultural or just anthropological level, there was pressure to participate in these forms of religion and Christians refusing to participate in them would have made them targets of persecution. Some of the early charges against Christians that we learn about, this is late in the first century, early in the, in the second century, is one, they were accused of being atheists because again, their, their rigorous monotheism made them, made them out to be in the perception of their neighbors atheistic because they were not interested in all of the gods. Uh, they ran the risk of being antagonistic to those gods. Uh, then the second thing that they were accused of is being misanthropic, of hating humanity. Um, and on one hand, that's the consequence of the above. If you don't venerate these gods and they get angry, we're all going to suffer as a result. But also there were rumors of, of cannibalism and incest because, again, the Lord's Supper, what does Jesus say? He says, eat my body and drink my blood. To an outsider, that sounds a lot like cannibalism. Or early Christians referred to each other as brothers and sisters, but some of these brothers and sisters went home and made babies, right? In, in the sense that they were a married couple, but they still referred to each other as brothers and sisters. And this gave the impression that they were in, in incestuous relationships. And so overall, it seems that it is the negative elements, it is their non-participation, it is their refusal to participate rather than their positive elements. So things like they believe that Jesus is the son of God or um, they believe that, that you know, God is the creator of the earth. It's more they're, they're saying no to parts of the Roman culture and religion rather than them affirming something specific about Christianity that led to their persecution one scholar who I think has, has provided one of the best perspectives of persecution in early Christianity from a Roman historical perspective, uh, G.E.M. de St. Croix, puts it this way. It was not so much the positive beliefs and practices of the Christians which aroused pagan hostility, but above all, the negative element in their religion, their total refusal to worship any god but their own. The monotheistic exclusiveness of the Christians was believed to alienate the goodwill of the gods, to endanger what the Romans called the Pax Deorum, the right harmonious relationships between gods and men, and to be responsible for disasters which overtook the community. So already early Christians were perceived as a danger and would have made themselves a good scapegoat for certain disasters that happened in a city or in a region. Uh, De St. Croix c continues and he, he offers a, a, a sort of an overview of developments in persecution. And he suggests three basic phases of persecution in early Christianity. Uh, the first is from the birth of Christianity to the fire in Rome under Nero in 63 CE. And for, for uh, De St. Croix, like the idea here is it's very regional, it's very sporadic, it's non-official persecution. And a, a good bit of it was, was led by, like we saw with Paul, uh, some Jewish uh, persecution of their co-religionists, of their fellow Jews who have aligned themselves with Judea, with, with the, the early Christian movement. 
from the fire in 64 until 250 CE. Again, we have no official policy of persecution in the Roman Empire. It's not universal. It's not empire-wide. But again, it's it's regional. It's sporadic. Um, there are now some more conversations that are happening about how do we determine whether or not someone's a Christian? How do we determine if they've committed a crime? Um, is it simply a crime to be identified as a Christian? These are all developments that are happening late in the first century and early in the second. And then the, the third form uh, or the third phase of Christianity is happens between 250 and 313. And in 250 is what scholars refer to as the great persecution under Decius, uh, Emperor Decius. This is when um, martyrdom really increased. This was one of, when we get closest to sort of an empire-wide policy for persecuting Christians. Sort of in, in, in a, an overall or, or a, a macro level, this is what he concludes, that there was no persecution before the Roman government, by the Roman government before 64, um, and that there was no widespread or general until Decius in 250. And that between 64 and 250, there were only these isolated and local persecutions. And that for the majority of this historical period, persecution came from below, that is from uh, other citizens, from their councils, maybe from their provincial authorities, um, rather than from above, from the empire, empire wide. And that's the, that's the case all the way through 250. In the, the early second century, we get some developments, and I encourage you to read uh, Pliny's letter that Blunt provides in his commentary on pages 11 and 12. We get the charge that being a Christian, simply being known as a Christian, is itself a crime sometime around 112, if not before. We have uh, Pliny's letter is, you know, helping uh, make sense of how do we how do we deal with these accusations? How do we know if they're valid? And also getting to the point of a sacrifice test where um, that's a way that a Christian could be released of their accusations was if they would sacrifice to the empire. Um, and if they wouldn't, then they would face perhaps death uh, as a result of their non-participation. Third, I want to just talk briefly about uh, Christianity in Asia Minor and some of the reasons why this might have been a place where early Christians experienced persecution. And I, again, I've provided more details on the slides that you can come back to. But if we just consider the seven churches that are addressed in Re Revelation 2 through 3, uh, as Brian Blunt points out in, in his commentary, these were regions that had very strong uh, religious and, uh, and imperial connections. These were places where there were great temples to a variety of, of Greek and Roman gods, where there were very strong and very early imperial cult connections connections. And so these were places where we would say the sort of everyday religion, the festivals and the sacrifices and the activities would have been very pronounced. And if you have early Christians, as we seem to have in Revelation, saying, no, I'm not going to participate, that could, could, could clearly lead to some persecution. And so uh, as we look at these seven churches in Revelation, I think that this is an important connection point to what we've already talked about. So when we think broadly about Christianity in Asia Minor, we can say that there was a strong presence and devotion to both civil religion and to the imperial cult. We can, we can say that the religion, the, there was a tremendous impact of religion on everyday life as um, people experienced religious uh, rituals and practices in their associations and guilds, in a variety of festivals, and even in private meals. That there then thirdly would be significant costs of non-participation, of unwillingness to participate in this could lead to social ostracism. It could lead to the loss of business connections. Uh, it might lead to physical abuse or sanctions or even imprisonment. And so generally speaking, Asia Minor fits these broader tendencies that we've seen about persecution in early Christianity. And perhaps there would have been more reason in Asia Minor for Christians to experience hardship because of how pronounced the religious life was in Asia Minor. I want to conclude with just a few questions uh, for reflection and for, for uh, thinking through together. The first is, to what degree does Revelation reflect the expectation of persecution 
versus the experience of persecution. This is a really import, uh, interesting point that Brian Blunt makes in the introduction to his commentary, is he thinks that Revelation is, is really expecting uh, persecution as a result of the perspective that it presses, rather than responding to the experience of persecution, as we might see in like a Hebrews or a First Peter. I wonder what you think about that. Second, I, I wonder how we should sort of square all of this about perse persecution in the early church with Revelation's really negative view of the Roman Empire or of the emperor or of Roman systems. And then finally, you know, sort of a theological, practical question is, how do we make sense of this part of Revelation or this perspective of Revelation in our teaching and preaching? Of course, we need to recognize that the religious world of the first and second century is not the same as the relig religious world of the 21st century, at least not in the U.S. And so what kind of parallels, what kind of analogies can we draw that might help Revelation uh, sort of help us navigate uh, these complex relationships between religion and economics and politics? Well, thank you so much for your time and your attention to this video lecture. I do hope that it's been helpful and will help our reading of Revelation as we move into the other sections of the book. Thank you and have a great day.